If you are able, I would ask that you would uh, stand for the reading of the sermon text and turn in your Bibles uh, or listen to Philippians 1, verses 27 through Philippians 2, verse 4. Chapter 1, verse 27 to chapter 2, verse 4. Hear now the word of God. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Please bow with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, May you give to us eyes to see and ears to hear what your Son proclaims to us this morning in your word. May your Spirit illumine to us the riches of your mercy and grace, all to the glory of your name. We pray all this in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Philippians may be one of the warmest most heartfelt epistles that we have in the whole New Testament. As we read chapter after chapter, verse after verse, we hear the love that a pastor has for his congregation and the love that a congregation has for their pastor. Uh, Paul begins this epistle by telling the Philippians that he is regularly thanking his God for them. And verse after verse, we feel the joy of Paul towards this church, a church that has partnered with him in the gospel. In chapter 4, we read about how they financially supported Paul and were there with him even despite his suffering, despite his imprisonment. And so we might read this epistle and think, here is a model church. Here must have been a perfect church, maybe even. But the Philippian church was no perfect church. Uh, It's not a model church ultimately because like all churches, it struggled with sinful tendencies. And we see that uh, for one, they, in, they experienced opposition. Uh, we read in verse 115 of those who were preaching for selfish gain, for rivalry, for even wanting to put down Paul. In chapter three, we read about those who were trying to put the Philippian church back under the law and maybe even most dangerous to this church In chapter 4, verse 2, we read, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. What Paul gives us a glimpse there is that for some reason, these two women, Euodia and Syntyche, potentially some of the founding members of this church were in conflict with one another, disunity, and maybe even threatened to tear this church apart. Paul knows this. Paul loves this church. And more than anything, he desires that they would stand firm together in the faith. In chapter 1, already he's given them this missionary report telling them of his confidence in both life and death, that Christ will be magnified, and now he is turning to the Philippian church directly, telling them that above all, they must live in unity together. He does this by presenting a picture of what it's like to live as Christian citizens, what it's like to be citizens of Christ's kingdom. He's presenting to us a picture that we as believers are not alone. 
we are united to Christ, and we are united together as the body of Christ. So let's see then this picture of Christian citizenship that Paul is painting for us here by stepping into verse 27 and seeing how citizens of Christ's kingdom stand firm together. Citizens of Christ's kingdom stand firm together. The beginning of verse 27 reads, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, if you have an ESV, uh, go ahead and take a look at the footnote for this verse, and other translations might have something similar. What you'll see there is that an alternate reading is only behave as citizens worthy of the gospel of Christ. And the reason why the editors of this translation put that there is because the word that's used to talk about uh, let your manner of life, it can mean that in that general sense, but more specifically, it means live as citizens. Paul here is drawing on the language of citizenship to call the Philippian church to live for Christ. Why is he doing this? Why would he draw on citizenship language? Well, first, what is a citizen? A citizen is just simply someone who enjoys special rights and privileges in a nation. In Rome, being a citizen was very difficult. There was only a select few that got that privilege. Paul, in fact, was one of those select few, and we see in Acts that one of the privileges that he had as a citizen was being able to appeal his case all the way to Caesar's court. So only a few people got this privilege. Uh, for me, I know living here in the US, having been born as a citizen of this country, it's easy for me to take my citizenship for granted. But for my grandfather, that was not the case. Uh, he immigrated here to the US with his family in the early 70s from India, came looking for new opportunities, for uh, more religious freedom, and before he passed away, he wrote an autobiography. And one of the last things that he wrote about in that autobiography was his thankfulness to have been able to come to a country where there was such freedom of religion, where he had so, so many opportunities. And he spoke about his joy of becoming a citizen of a land that was once foreign to him. He had become a citizen of a land that had been once foreign to him. My grandfather understood that his citizenship in this foreign land that now had become his own, came with privileges, came with blessings, and it also came with duties. It came with a certain identity, a certain way of life. And that is what Paul is drawing on here, that our citizenship as Christians, as being part of the kingdom of Christ, is a blessed, a high, a glorious calling that also comes with a way of life and with a certain identity. It comes first by recognizing that this is something that none of us have earned. If you have put your trust in Christ, your faith in our Lord, uh, know that it is all a gift, even your citizenship. In Colossians 1, verses 13 through 14, you read, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the blessing that we get as citizens of Christ's kingdom, that we deserve absolutely nothing from God. And yet in his mercy, in his kindness, he plucked us out of the domain of darkness and set us in the, the kingdom of his son that we get to enjoy forgiveness of sins, not because we deserve it, not because of anything worthy in us, but because of how worthy our king is. That is the blessing, and that is the privilege we get as citizens in this kingdom. And it comes with an identity. It comes with a way of life. What is that way of life? Well, Paul tells us. He says, so, whether, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. This is what life in the kingdom of Christ looks like. It looks like standing firm upon our faith, side by side, shoulder to shoulder, striving forward for the gospel of Christ. 
our hearts and our wills are bound together, working day after day to present every member mature in Christ until the day of Christ, when he will take us to be home with him forever. See, despite our different ethnicities, despite our different ages and backgrounds, despite even different political beliefs and a whole host of other differences, we stand united for the purpose of the gospel. We stand united to magnify the name of Christ in the midst of a crooked generation. Like many sailors, each different, each unique, each with their own oar in their hand, yet all together rowing together for one purpose, so we, each with our distinct and unique capabilities and unique gifts that God has given to us, are all working together for one goal, to be with Christ, to persevere in this life, to call others to faith and to repentance. Brothers and sisters, do you take your citizenship in this kingdom for granted? With all of the cares that we have in life, with how easy it is for us to go through the motions of school, of work, of church, we can forget how glorious it is to be called a child of God. We were once living in the depth of darkness, but God has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. What a glorious gospel, and what a high calling, what a privilege it, ha- it is that we can live worthy of this gospel. And yet, we can all say that this life is not easy. As long as we are sojourners on this earth, it can feel like a battle to trust Christ. And Paul understands this. He goes on in the following verses to explain that despite opposition, despite suffering, despite these things that seem to upend our faith in Christ, we need not, be, we need not have fear in the face of opposition and suffering. We need not wonder at God's sovereignty, for God has appointed this for us, for his good purposes. Let's see in verses 28 through 29 how citizens of Christ's kingdom endure suffering for Christ's sake. Citizens of Christ's kingdom endure suffering for Christ's sake. Verse 21, verse 28 reads, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. Paul understands that this Philippian church is under attack, is being opposed in many ways. Like we've already mentioned in verse uh, 15 of chapter 1, there were those who were preaching for their own selfish gain and rivalry. Chapter 3 speaks of those who were trying to call the Philippian church to go back to the Old Testament laws, put themselves back under the Old Covenant. And for certain, this Philippian church was surrounded by pagans who despised the fact that this group of Christians were worshiping a crucified man. And Paul encourages them to not be frightened. Why? Because they are set apart for salvation. And in their courage, they can have confidence that that is a sign of the destruction of their enemies. How can this be? How could this courage be a sign of their salvation and of the destruction of those who oppose them? Well, how is it, brothers and sisters, that we stand firm in the face of opposition? Is it because we are somehow strong enough to withstand the attacks of the devil? Is it somehow because we're able to look inside of ourselves and find some inner power, some inner courage? It's not. It's not by looking inside of ourselves, but looking outside of ourselves. It is by looking to Christ and there seeing the one who was opposed by men upon earth, was opposed by the devil, and yet stayed, persevered to the end, suffered on the cross in our place, died, rose again, and is seated on high upon his throne. He is the one who has persevered to the end, and we are weak and frail, but when we trust in him, we are showing to the world that it is not by our power that we stand firm as Christians. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit who has united us to Christ. Paul, in verse 6 of chapter 1, had said, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. 
that is our confidence, that God began a good work in us the moment that we put our faith in Christ. And he, by his power, will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. Do you endure opposition in your life? Uh, some of you maybe at work feel like your faith is ridiculed or opposed, maybe at school from your neighbors around you or just simply from seeing the ways that Christianity is often mocked today. Have courage, brothers and sisters. Do not be frightened, for we worship a king who will persevere us to the end. And suffering goes beyond just merely opposition from those who hate Christ. Uh, suffering is something that we can experience throughout our lives in so many different ways. In verse 28 through 29, uh, verse 29, Paul says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Paul here is not speaking about suffering for unrighteousness sake. He's not talking about the suffering that might come when we sin or when we uh, are going against Christ, but he is speaking about suffering of all kinds. Things from our struggles with health issues, financial struggles, uh, all kinds of suffering in this life are oppositions to our faith. They can turn us away from Christ. And yet we can be confident that just like God is sovereign over our lives in the good times, he is sovereign over our lives even in our suffering. And he is using it for his purposes because we are in the kingdom of Christ. But know this, that reality that suffering is used for our good is only true of those who are children of God, are true of those who have put their faith in Christ. Friend, you can have no hope in this life or the next, in suffering or success, apart from Christ. You see, apart from Christ, suffering is merely a foretaste of the judgment that will come to all who die apart from Jesus. And so if that is you, if you sit here not knowing Jesus Christ as king over your life, Turn this day to trust in him who suffered upon the cross for his people, who took on the shame and the condemnation that all of us deserve for our law-breaking, for our sins against God, who died but did not stay dead, who rose again and who is seated on high. Turn this day to him and find in him purpose even in the midst of suffering. And brothers and sisters, if you are struggling to maintain hope this day in the midst of suffering, whether it's a health issue, whether it is a financial problem, whether it's uh, struggling with family issues, or whatever it might be that you're going through, know that you have a Savior who has endured it all in your place and who sympathizes with you. One who understood this was a 16th century reformer Martin Luther. He's the one credited with sparking the Reformation because of his stand for the gospel, and he was a man who suffered unimaginable suffering, uh, more than any of us are probably going through. He was condemned to death. He was forced to go into hiding. He experienced constant conflict in his life, even rejection from close companions. He suffered great sickness from the plague and only just survived it and regularly struggled with bouts of depression and self-doubt. And yet despite that, he could say these words. Christian suffering is nobler and precious above all other human suffering because since Christ himself suffered, he also hallowed the suffering of all Christians. What Martin Luther understood was that Jesus Christ humbled himself even to the point of death, suffered the greatest suffering that we could imagine, the wrath of God for his people. And he endured it to the end, and he sympathizes with you, brothers and sisters, in your suffering. The reality is we rarely have the answers for the purpose of our suffering. All we can know is that God is using it for his glory 
and he is using it to refine us for our good, and that one day he will bring us to be home with him, where suffering will be no more. Every tear will be wiped away, and we shall enjoy blessedness with his son forever. With this in mind, Paul then wants to give this Philippian church a plan to live out this life, uh, a model to live out this life as they await that day when tears will be no more. Uh, do we need to endure suffering alone? Paul says no. Paul turns our attention to our union with Christ and because of our union in Christ to our unity through humility. So let's see now chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 how citizens of Christ's kingdom live in unity together. Verse 1 of chapter 2 begins, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Hear the tenderness of the Apostle Paul towards this congregation in chapter 1. He, he reminds them of the encouragement that is in Christ, a comfort from love, participation in the Spirit, affection and sympathy. These are not just mere hypotheticals. He's not saying if as if we are not certain if they're true. No, these are true of all believers. Brothers and sisters, there is encouragement in Christ. There is comfort from love. There is partic participation in spirit. There is affection and sympathy from a God who loves us and amongst believers who love one another. We are united in Christ, encouraged by him, united by the Holy Spirit. We are bound together with these blessings, with this great privilege of this great love of our God. And because of that, and only because of who Christ is, we can have the same mind, the same love, living in full accord, living with one purpose. That is Paul's joy. In verse 2, his greatest joy would be to see this Philippian church mend whatever disunity, whatever bickering, whatever is separating them, so that they can live in humble unity together. In verse 3, we read, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. How do we stand firm on the gospel? How do we strive side by side for the purpose of Christ? How can we stand confident in the midst of opposition, in the midst of suffering we do it because we are united to Christ and we do it through humility for one another. We do it united, seeking the interests of others above our own. This is how we can make it through this life. Brothers and sisters, there are no lone Christians. Rather, we are all single-mindedly together as brothers and sisters, as one family, as one kingdom, as we are citizens of it, to, go, to call others to turn to Christ and to build one another up in the faith. It is true. Some are called to be ministers, some elders and deacons, others faithful lay members. Some of you have great knowledge, other of you great wisdom, other of you great encouragement. We each have so much uh, so many different gifts and are each coming from so many different backgrounds, yet we are one body. We are all working to present each other mature in Christ. We are united through humility, each of us looking to the interest of others, uh, looking to the interest of others above ourselves, each of us counting others more significant than ourselves. Children, Consider how you, can, cons how you can put the interests of others before your own. Consider how you can be an encouragement to your friends at church when they're feeling down. Uh, consider the interests of your parents above your own. Brothers and sisters, think of the great privilege that we have to be able to sacrifice our finances, our time, our energy, 
for the purpose of the gospel, to be able to help a brother or a sister in need, even at our own inconvenience, to be able to bear their own burdens, to be united together even when it hurts us, even when it's difficult for us, knowing this, that our Savior has done so much more already for us. As Paul will go on to say, Christ humbled himself by taking the form of a servant. And he humbled himself further by dying upon a cross for us. This is what our Savior did for us in our place. And it is a privilege that we get to follow after him by living in humility with one another. Yodia and Syntyche in chapter 4 had lost this sight. They lost the fact that they had a shared inheritance in Christ. They let worldly matters separate them. And the only antidote to that disunity was humility. Brothers and sisters, if there is any grudge among you, if there is any rivalry, any selfishness, this week, even this day, humble yourself. Mend that broken relationship. Seek unity amongst the body of Christ. Selfish ambition, conceit have no place in the church, for we are fellow citizens of this great kingdom. We have nothing to boast in, nothing to say, I have earned this place. We can only boast in Christ. And we can only live for him by serving his flock. This is all a gift from God, and we have this privilege to be called by this gospel, to have this worthy calling, to be citizens of Christ's kingdom. What a privilege, what a blessing it is that we can work together in unity. Pray with me. Father, we praise you for uniting us together in your son, Jesus Christ. We have confidence that by your spirit, you will complete in us the good work you began. And so, Father, we ask for humility among this body. We ask for steadfastness in the face of opposition and in the face of suffering. We ask that we might live worthy according to the gospel, not because we are earning our salvation, not because we are trying to earn your favor, but because we have so great a king who has died for us and given us every spiritual blessing in the heavens. All this we pray in his name. Amen.